Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Bible Study. Welcome to the Fellowship Bible Church Facebook page. Great to have everybody with us tonight. This is what we need is uh, while we're going through this time and it lingers on a little bit, we, uh, we need to take these opportunities to assemble like this and, and uh, especially like this. For this purpose, we want to give our attention to God's Word, and that's what we need more than anything. And uh, I just want to say hello to a few people tonight. Uh, I see April is here who greets us as siblings. Yes, hello, fellow spiritual siblings, brothers and sisters. Uh, Ron Sable's here tonight. Hi, Ron. I see Barb and Chris and uh, Ken is here and Judy and uh, Roberta's here. And I see Tamara's here. Hi, Tamara. Great to have you with us. And uh, I see Victor and Deacon Steve is with us, Angie, Peely. Uh, and my computer's doing something that I can't understand. So, but um, Angela's here. Uh, I'm not too gifted with this, but look, I see there's a bunch of people here tonight, and I'm really happy about that. So welcome to all of you. Uh, let's go right into this. We're going to be in Second Peter, Second uh, Peter chapter two, and so if you want to open your Bible to that, and let me open us with a word of prayer, and then we'll go right into it. Let's pray, everybody. Welcome. Thank you, Lord God, that we have the opportunity here tonight to read from the scriptures. And I know the subject matter, Lord, of this passage of Scripture is a really strong one, a strong warning about false teachers and the, the corruption that that brings to people's understanding and then the, the destructive fruit of that. And so I pray, Lord God, you'd help us to take these things seriously and, and learn from them well and be on guard and apply ourselves with all diligence to the things that you call us to. Help us to see clearly and to be led by your Spirit, to be humble before you, praying always, and seeking to be taught from the Scriptures. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to start tonight, maybe a little bit of an unusual way, before I actually read from the text. I, we had a prayer time a couple of nights ago, and uh, um, when I was praying, I don't like write out you know, my prayers, but but I went back into it and watched the video again, and uh, I kind of wrote down a little part of, of what I had said, which is just like the Spirit was just leading me, and I prayed. And, and, uh, uh, but I said this, and I'll explain why I want to repeat this again in a moment. When I was praying, I said, Please, Lord, I pray that your children would take their promptings and their directions and their guidance and their influence, not from anything in this world, not from popular media, not from the weight of things happening in the world or current events, but that your children and your church would be led by your spirit, that we would be led by Christ, and that we would live, that we would worship, that we would love in a way that brings glory to Jesus, that we would take our leading from you. No matter what's going on, help us to remain the glorious church which you said the gates of hell would not prevail against. The church that you are building, your kingdom, built on the foundation of Christ himself, and then on the apostles and on the scriptures. So then the next day, which was yesterday, I was texting with a few people in the morning at the same time, and one brother that I was texting with wrote this to me. Listen to this. All the things that have been going on recently have impacted so many of our brothers and sisters locally and globally. We really need to be very careful who we listen to. We really need biblical discernment to guard our hearts and minds so that we are not led astray from what we have learned and are being taught by our Lord. If we are confused, divided, led astray, following the culture, how can we be salt and light to lead people to Christ? That really impacted me because it was so like right in line with what I had prayed the night before and like this was the next morning and it was it was like I just sensed the Lord was really trying to tell me something then then another brother within minutes of of that text I got this part of what someone else had written to me he said before the end it will become like the days of Noah so the degradation will go further and the last bastion to stand the church will be the only thing standing firm against the beast. Our job as Christians is to show the salt and light. 
by not huddling among ourselves on defense. Rather, go into all the world as leaders and show what a life in Christ is. And if you see, kind of what is in common with all three of those things is that we have to be careful if we're going to fulfill what God has called us to do, we have to be careful like where we take our direction from. Obviously, we want to be led by God. We are the church. Christ is the head. We want to be led by Christ. His Spirit lives in us. We, want, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We want to be led by the Holy Spirit. And we need to be taught and instructed by the Scriptures. We need to live in the way. Having come to faith in Christ and received salvation... By grace, Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. We are utterly hopeless without what Jesus did. Totally by his grace, having received that salvation, we now want to live not directed by what's going on today and then what's going on next week and what's going on here and trying to like kind of fit in with this and fit in with that. And No, we need to continue to consistently take our direction from God as he teaches us through the word. And it was so amazing to me that kind of all this crystallized while we are in the midst of studying this passage of scripture. Because this passage of scripture is about threats to that teaching. False teachers, Peter said, will be among you. And they'll introduce all sorts of what he called destructive heresies. It's in the beginning of chapter 2, which is to say that there will be false influences and false teachers right in among the Christians, in the churches and in their lives, who are going to be introducing, well, we need to be about this, or we need to be doing that, or we need to be about this, and offering all sorts of things that get out of what it is that God is simply and plainly trying to woo us and coach us and teach us and lead us in as he reveals it in his word. In the first chapter of 2 Peter, right, it's very straightforward. Peter reminded us of God's grace and the peace that we have with him, all by his grace and his goodness to us, talking about his divine power, giving us everything that we need, and we're partakers from the divine nature. We've been all over this, right? And so because of this graciousness of God and all these precious promises that he's given us, we are to what? Give all diligence to add to our faith, those things that it listed, like virtue and knowledge and self-control and, and steadfastness and brotherly kindness, ultimately leading to love. But the way of the Christian is not to just go along with the flow of the world and respond to this and respond to that and be ready with an answer. For, listen, we are like, if we're going to be salt and light, we can't take our direction from just what the world thinks is important right now. Oh, it's okay to have an opinion in it, and it's okay to respond to unrighteousness, and it's okay to affirm things that are good. But as Christians, we must always primarily be directed by what God is saying. And what God is saying here is, now that you're a believer... You have all my promises, partakers of the divine nature. You have all this power working in you, right? Now I want you to give all diligence to building on your faith and adding these elements of Christian character that lead to Christian conduct, which produces Christian fruit, which glorifies Christ. And we have to be careful not to let ourselves become obsessed with things that can bump us off. And then he goes into chapter 2 and he says, just like there were prophets, false prophets among the people in the ancient times, so you are going to have false teachers among you and they're going to bring these destructive heresies in and uh, uh, even the most important thing he says in the beginning of the passage was denying the Lord who bought them. So, in other words, coming in, teaching things that completely undermine and strip away the practical lordship, sovereignty, uh, rule, authority of Jesus in our day-to-day -day lives. He's just told us, here's what I want you to do with your faith. You need to grow because you need to be a good testimony and you need to preach the gospel to people and you need to be my ambassadors. We're not here to be all immersed in everything that the world is going on. We're to be immersed in this 
and then we are to reach out and try to immerse the world in the words of the gospel, which can bring salvation and make people new creations when they believe. We take our direction from God. All right? False teachers will come in and try to get you off of that. And there are so many forms that that can take, whether it's the person who corrupts the gospel itself and tries to make the gospel about works or about you know, human achievement or, or, or perceived human righteousness or, or, or sacraments or, or, or systems of religion where we try to justify ourselves, uh, or it's people who corrupt the gospel by saying, well, you know, the thing about Jesus is nice, but it can't just be about Jesus. There's so many other religions in the world and many paths to God and, you know, and everything else. There's so many heresies that can corrupt the, the singular focus of the gospel message itself, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, and that we are saved by his grace, not any of our own achievement. We are utterly corrupt and unable to earn anything before God. He has saved us by his grace and his love, and through faith in Christ and that alone there is salvation. False teachers will come and corrupt that. But then, of course, there's also the body of teaching within the church, whether it's like the prosperity gospel and the, the word of faith message that gets the Christian mind off of suffering and enduring hardships and actually flips that around and tells Christians that, you know, God wants you to be, you know, you know self-actualized and, and happy and blessed and prosperous. And if you'll just do this, 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 this and believe this and give this and everything else, God will bless your life in this way way and God will bless your life in that way. And listen, before you know it, you have all these varied destructive heresies that come into the church that strip away the fact that Jesus is our Lord and I am called to follow him and serve him now and even endure hardship and suffering, even love my enemies and pray for people who persecute me and, and all along the way wanting to preach the gospel to people. Peter says you're going to have False teachers among you are going to try to do that. And even in the current situation in the world, we need to be careful. We need to be careful to not just like, okay, this happens, and now we need to like put all of our focus and emphasis on responding to that, or this happens, and we need to respond to that. Listen, we're still called, as my brothers told me in their texts, to be salt and light and to take our leading from God from Christ, from the scriptures, as his spirit leads us. Now, with all of that said, let me read some of this for you. And, and I'm going to pick it up in verse 4. All right? Uh, and th this first part of this, just follow along with me. Peter says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Their Lord, no, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust for punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. That is a long way. And, and, and listen, as I've said before, chapter two of this letter is a long rant. It's not, a, it's not an uncontrolled one. It's not a directionless one. It's not strictly an emotional one. But Peter's words are strong and they are about one thing. People who would corrupt teaching in the church, whether it's preaching the gospel or laying then on the foundation of the gospel, the things that the apostles taught 
that they received from Christ, how his servants now ought to live while we're here, those people are in trouble. The entire chapter is basically about two things, how depraved false teachers are and how doomed false teachers are. And that's it. And it just goes, the, the, the phrases, everything that he says either describes in some way um, how negatively he feels about false teachers or how doomed they ultimately are. Because it's so vital that Christians not get bumped off by anything. And thus he warns them. And thus he warns us. That section that I just read to you basically just says, listen, God destroyed the angels who sinned you know, in the, in the rebellion way back in the beginning. He was able to single them out, but he was able to spare the faithful ones. God destroyed the ancient world, that is in Noah's day, before, because of all of the flood of unrighteousness that was going on. He destroyed them with a flood of waters. Yet, he was able to spare Noah and his wife and the three sons and their three wives. He spared eight people. When Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis chapter 19, when Sodom and Gomorrah got out of control with all the immorality and wickedness that was going on there, God destroyed them but was able to spare righteous Lot and his wife and his two daughters, although it didn't turn out very well for the rest of the family afterwards, but God was able to destroy what he meant to destroy, spare and save what he meant to save. And speaking of Lot, it says in here that Lot was tormented living in that place because all he did was he looked around and he saw sin here and he saw sin there and he saw violence here and he saw immorality there. And maybe sometimes we get like that living in the society and at the time that we do. Every time we look around, there's another terrible thing that's, that, that, that's going on. Listen, the point of it is God has shown in the past that he knows how in his time to deal with and judge and destroy that which needs to be judged and destroyed at the same time sparing and saving that which he intends to spare and to save. And so... Christians, be comforted. False teachers who would dare corrupt what it is that God is trying to speak to his children, be warned. Right? Now, going on from that, we come to the uh, second half of verse 10. And starting here, some years ago, I kind of I listed out like some of the different sayings here. And let's just, uh, I'll just kind of go through these as we read it rather than reading it all at once for time's sake. Because like I said, it's long and it's, it's fierce and it's serious. So he starts off, they, meaning these false teachers that he said would be among the church, among the Christians. They're presumptuous. They're self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, right? And so that first, that first passage, the first few words here describe a very narcissistic bent that false teachers have. They are all about themselves. And when it speaks here of dignitaries, we would understand that word maybe to speak of people who are of some important station in life. It's possible that there is some idea there, but most of the commentaries you would read about this would point out that the word is probably more talking about um, those fallen angels, uh, people who are in a different realm than us, uh, not people, but beings, angels in a different realm than us who have fallen, and yet they still occupy a place in God's sovereign plan that is much more powerful than ours. You know, you hear preachers sometimes, you know, shouting at Satan, do this, or, or shouting at demons and devils and, and everything else, and it's like, here, Peter is saying people are so full of themselves that they're not afraid to like just open up their mouths and say things with authority and power that they don't even have, right? So there's a narcissistic bent that's revealed there. Then the next thing he says, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. So angels who are more powerful than men won't speak out against these other fallen beings, right? Yet these false teachers, because they're so full of themselves, they will. 
Verse 12, but these, like natural brute beasts, which is an eloquent way to say wild animals. They're, that's what these, that, that's, Peter's rough here, man. That's what he calls these false teachers. He calls them wild animals. But these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption, right? I couldn't think of a more eloquent word to describe that than blowhards. Sorry. <laughs> but that's what they are. They are, they are, they are, these false teachers will just stand up and they'll say anything about anyone to try to twist and manipulate people and bump them off from what it is that God wants them to do. Notice they will utterly perish in their own corruption, which is their destiny. Verse 13 says that they will receive the wages of unrighteousness. What's the wages of unrighteousness? Death, the soul that sins, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. As those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime, they are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. So what do you see here? They are carousers. They unashamedly love and practice carnal pleasure and they bring other people along. You know, you see the false teacher who, you know, they live, they preach a certain thing, but they live a lifestyle that is often lavish and extravagant on the backs of people who are much more poor than they are and they carouse with them and they, uh, they partake lavishly of carnal pleasures and they not only do it for themselves, but they try to drag other people along with them, which is probably more of just a method of validating and justifying themselves. But they are carousers. What's at the heart of that? What's next? They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity, a dumb donkey, speaking with a man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. And you can read about that story in Numbers chapter 22, I think it is, in the Old Testament, as the children of Israel were uh, wandering. Their enemies, the Moabites, I believe, uh, were trying to hire this prophet to speak something evil against the children of Israel. And so Balaam, this prophet, becomes sort of like the, uh, the patriarch of all false prophets who will say anything for money. And what motivates that? Covetousness. They are not just covetous. They are trained in covetous practices. They're greedy and they're good at it. Right? They know how to satisfy their covetousness and their greed, and they will say anything that gets them paid. That's one of the biggest characteristics of false prophets, false teachers. They're all about saying what people who want to hear so they can underwrite their lavish, carnal desires. Pause. There's more. It goes on like this. And we will in a moment. But just pause for a minute. This happens. Peter said this is going to happen among you. It happens among people today. What is the result of it? These destructive heresies. Remember what we were told to do in chapter 1? Give all diligence and add this to your faith and add that to your faith. All that goes by the wayside. And instead we become obsessed with getting riches for ourselves or justifying ourselves or just wanting to feel good about ourselves or, or we get obsessed with the church's position on politics. We get obsessed with the church's position on social issues. We get obsessed with the, uh, the, the just, just various things that have nothing to do with what God wants to do with the people that he bought with his blood. We don't take our lead from this world. We don't look at all the riches and luxuries of the world and try to figure out a way to spin Christianity so we can get it for ourselves. 
but a lot of people do it and a lot of people support it and buy into it and peter warns them because the the destruction that is caused is it gets people off from growing as the disciples, learning to endure hardship and suffering as you preach the gospel and display the love of Christ in your living, glorifying him with fruit. All right, back on. Verse 17 says, there are wells without water. What's a well without water? They are clouds carried by a tempest. What is that? Useless, right? A well without water is useless. A cloud that's just blown around but doesn't drop any rain is no good to a farmer. That's basically what they are. They're useless, right? And look at this. Uh, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So like I said, Peter, like in this rant, if you will, he interchangeably goes back and forth with here's what they are and here's what's coming to them. Here's what a false teacher is. Here's what a false teacher can expect. They're useless and basically eternal condemnation, darkness forever is what they can expect if they don't repent. And repentance for this, these false teachers would mean nothing short of coming out and utterly, completely renouncing everything that they have wrought. Now God receives the humble and God receives repentance and you should play, pray for false teachers to repent. But what Peter is saying here is, you know what? Oh, by the way, this phrase, reserve the blackness of darkness forever, is almost verbatim stated by Jude as well. I told you that in the book of Jude. I think just for time's sake, I'm not going to turn there. But if you want to read that is parallel to this, and it's, it, in Jude, it's the entire letter. It's just one chapter, and the whole chapter is, the whole thing is this. So this Second Peter chapter 2 isn't even the only chapter in the Bible that's like this. There's an entire book, the book of Jude, that shares same concepts and in a couple of places even the same words to describe all of this mess. Verse 18, For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness... That's, that's one of the characteristics of false teachers. They can get very passionate and very excited, but what they're saying is just nothing. It's just nothing. It's nothing that promotes anything that's truly from God. They speak all these things and they can whip a crowd into a frenzy, but they're not promoting holiness like people said, you know, as the scripture says, be holy for I am holy. They're not promoting that... Uh, that we should follow Jesus and serve him. They're not promoting that you should preach the gospel to people. When's the last time you heard like a, like a, uh, like a multi-millionaire televangelist encourage people, you need to go out and you need to be sharing the gospel with people and, they're, and, and a lot of those people are going to turn and they're going to hate you and they're going to reject you and you just need to love them and pray for them and endure whatever hardship comes your way. That usually doesn't fill in the holes between send me your money so I can buy a new suit and a new car, Right? So they just speak these swelling words of emptiness. They allure through the lusts of the flesh. Look at this, through lewdness. Lewdness is like perversion, sensuality, often in the sexual realm, not always, but mostly. That's what lewdness is. In other words, there's a carnal, even sort of twisted, sexualized appeal sometimes, you know, in, in the false teacher world. And they, it says... The ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. Those are the ones that they allure, right? So people who have come to Christ and have escaped that lifestyle, they come into the church and they find teachers luring them back into what they left. This is why it's dangerous. If you, you gotta get, hang around with Christians. and You want to be careful about waxing nostalgic about what you used to be before you knew Christ. He didn't save us out of that stuff so he could like, so we could like be entertained by it. We don't tell war stories about what kind of sinners we used to be. But now here, Peter is saying there are teachers that'll come right into the church and they're happy to just let you go right on sinning, do whatever it is that you used to do as long as they get paid. That's what the false teacher does, man. Destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. Right? So they're lewd. And then the last part of this, verse 19 
while they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption, right? So freedom, right? There's great freedom, but they themselves are not free from anything. Why? Because they're phonies. They are not preaching that which they themselves have experienced. The false teacher is not really a Christian. That's what this is saying. They're imposters. They're charlatans. While they promise liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, that's a description of someone coming to Christ. We are in bondage to this world, but when the gospel is preached to us and we believe, look, we still battle and struggle with the flesh and with sin, but man, we have been set free. We don't, we don't pursue and chase that stuff anymore, right? If they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. And I think there's a bit of rhetoric in this. There, it would better them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But what is it? It's happened to them, as uh, it says of the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. I don't think Peter is trying to establish here people losing their salvation because they battle and struggle with sin. He's talking here about the false teacher who knows what he's doing and himself is just a phony and a fake and the very thing that he professes to have walked away from so that he could establish himself as this well-known preacher or teacher so he can gather whatever it is to himself that he wants to, he actually just runs right when the camera's off, just runs right back into the sinfulness that supposedly he stands against, like a dog returning to its vomit or like a pig wallowing in the mud, right? That's what the false teacher is like. So what is all that? False teachers, they're narcissistic, they're blowhards, they're carousers, they're covetous, they're useless, they're lewd, they're phonies. Hey, listen, man. <laughs> There's like not one good redeeming thing said in this chapter. Why? What's the point of it all? God, by his grace, through what Jesus accomplished. Think of what Jesus endured to purchase us for God. The only righteous one who ever lived willingly surrendered himself to be betrayed, to be falsely accused and lied about, to be physically beaten beyond what any man could possibly endure, to shed his blood and die the shameful death of crucifixion on the cross. Jesus did not go through all of that so that once we are redeemed and saved and there is by his grace, there is no more condemnation. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. But now the life that we have left here on this earth, give all your diligence to adding the right things to your faith. Virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, brotherly kindness, Love. Use, listen, we can't do that in and of our own strength. Use the strength that God supplies. Pray. Read and study the word. Get, listen, you know what the bottom line here is? The difference between a good teacher you should listen to and the false teacher that you should shun. And that's the right word. The good teacher that you should listen to is the one who promotes the stuff in chapter 1. The false teacher is the one whose ministry and life fits into the description in chapter 2. Like one of those text messages from my brother said, we need to be discerning. Discerning means you understand God's word and you're able to practically apply it in your life. You want to be discerning? Keep your nose in your Bible. Keep your knees bent and your heads bowed and your prayers ascending to the throne of God. Stay before the Lord. Learn the truth. Be courageous. Learn the truth 
and pray for strength in the Holy Spirit to walk according to the truth. He has given to us everything that we need for life and godliness, everything. It is he who works in us to will and to do for his good pleasure. And so what are we to do? To work out, live it out, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. God works it in, you live it out. Listen to teachers who promote truly become his disciple, be, being his disciple, walking by faith and not by sight, leaning on his grace and not on self-righteousness or success or anything else. Shun the ones. Turn them off. Paul wrote in Romans 16, mark those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and from such turn away. That's the bottom line to all this. That's why Peter is so ferocious in this chapter because he knows the corruption, the ruination spiritually that false teachers cause. So be careful and be wise. The only way of salvation for a person is by God's grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are nothing. We are not called to receive this, receive that. We're nothing. We're called to receive Jesus by faith. He died for your sins because he loves you. He was buried and on the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended back to heaven. Listen, he fulfilled all the requirements of the law that you never could. He bore the penalty of the law, which is death on your behalf. And then he conquered death itself by rising from it. Hallelujah. Now you humble yourself and you put your faith in Christ. And once you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, as many as receive them, to them he gives the power to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. Once you receive that, once you are his by faith, then in the strength with he supplies, you add to that faith these things that Peter says to, that you might become his disciple, his ambassador. Get your leading and your direction from God and people that God uses to open the scriptures and bring forth the truth. Don't entertain what's false. Learn to discern, and that is a function of this. Let's close with prayer. Our Father in heaven, dear Lord God, help us to be discerning. Help us to embrace good teaching that leads us in the path that you want us to walk. And help us to rebuke courageously and shun that which is false. That we might become the kind of disciples you wish and bear the fruit that you rightly deserve. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, your patience, your love. Thank you for your gospel. That's what we all need. Thank you, Lord, for this evening. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray. Amen. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, boy, can I get a few hellos in here? I don't know if I can read them all. Something, this computer is not very good, so sorry about that. Um, I'm going from the bottom here. Hi, Laura. I'm hi, Laureen. And... Uh, Let's see, Amy's here. Hi, Amy. And I see Wanda. Great to see you, Wanda. Ron Cusimano is there. Sergeant Ducky, Master Sergeant, good to see you. Brother Phil is there. There's my mom. Hi, Mom. Brother Hector's here. Hi, guys. Jamie, God bless you. Josh, what's up, Josh? Good to see you, man. And there's a, a couple names I don't recognize, but uh, uh, Jinlia, I think you're a friend of Ron's, right? It's good to have you with us tonight. Sister Angie's here. God bless you. Deacon Chris is there. Janice. Hey, Janice. What's up? El Bebo. I think that's Carlos. What's up, Carlos? Good to see you, brother. And uh, and there's some other names in here. Grace is here. Angela. And I, I think I, I've gone far enough. Victor's here. And Deacon Steve and Tamara there. Hey, listen. Great to see all you folks. God bless you. Hey, listen. Saturday morning, it's a couple days from now, is the Women's Fellowship. It's going to be on Zoom You'll get some information how to connect with that tomorrow. Sister Etta is going to be sharing the word with the ladies. And I know that's going to be awesome and exciting. It's 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. So watch for a, a text, I guess probably from Roberta, that'll come by uh, probably tomorrow. So you'll be ready for that. Okay, everybody? And we'll be back right here on Facebook Live 
Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Hope you can join in. God bless you, everybody. Good night.